Good afternoon, brothers and sisters and friends. Uh, we have before us uh, a study which is full of uh, hope and is a very exciting uh, study. It's a study on Israel's future as told by the Bible. And what we're going to find this afternoon is that the future of Israel plays an essential role uh, in the fulfillment of the gospel, of the gospel message. And so an understanding of Israel's future, uh, as told by the Bible, is essential to fully understanding, then, the gospel message. Um, many Christians today believe that the gospel message is that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent so that we could have our sins forgiven, uh, that we could be reconciled to God, and we could re receive salvation. And while that is a key component to the gospel message, what we're going to see today is that that's only half of the gospel message. That he was the seed promised and that he is the way to salvation, but what he came to accomplish uh, is very much connected to Israel's future. And so we're going to look into that and, uh, and see what the Bible has to say about Israel's future. Now many believers today uh, hold the belief that Israel as a nation has already fulfilled God's plan. They've already fulfilled God's, their role in God's plan and that God is simply finished with the Jewish people. Um, his dealings with the natural descendants of Abraham have come to uh, completion. And what we're going to explore today is what does God say about Israel's future? How does God feel towards his people? And what are the plans and the thoughts that he has for them? And what we're going to see is that their future is a very exciting future, and their future is going to directly and dramatically affect all the other nations upon the earth. And so as we said from the get-go, Israel's future plays an essential role in the fulfillment of the gospel. And so we begin by pointing to this verse um, on this slide which is Paul speaking, and he says, For the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. So Israel's future will become an essential part of the gospel message. And we ask the question, why would the Apostle Paul, who many people know about Paul, he was one of the greatest preachers of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the, the glad tidings in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would he, one of the most dedicated and powerful preachers of the gospel of Christ, when preaching, he was in house arrest, he was near the end of his life. Why would he say in Acts 28, verse, verse 20, that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain? And the reason is, is of course, because the hope of Israel is to say the gospel message. That the gospel message can, can be described as being one and the same with the hope of Israel. Again, we look at Acts 26 and verses 6 to 7. And again, Paul, he is standing, uh, he's on trial before King Agrippa, and he's being accused here for preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the promised seed. He was the seed promised that would come and, and confirm the promises or make the promises available and possible. And he says this, he says, I stand and am tried for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And so Paul here says he is being tried for what? For the hope of the promise that God made to their fathers. And so on the one hand, he preaches the hope of Israel, and what we find is that the hope of Israel is founded upon promises that God made to their forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, uh, and to Jacob. So let's take a look then. We have to, we have, obviously, we are interested to find out what are these promises that God made to their fathers. Um, because if that makes up the hope of Israel, and Paul says that the hope of Israel is obviously connected to the gospel message, 
then we need to take a look and consider what are these promises. So what we want to do is establish just how important uh, these promises are in the Bible. And we turn then to Romans chapter 15, verses 8 to 12. And we read there, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will pray, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles hope. And there's three main things that we want to point out here in Romans chapter 15. The first is that the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very mission, the thing that he came to accomplish was to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So if we say that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we're following after him, we need to know well, what did he come to do? And one of the things was to confirm those promises. So we need to know what those promises are and how and what, what sort of effect they have upon our faith. That's firstly. The second thing we, we find from Romans chapter 15 is that in the Lord Jesus Christ or connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Gentiles have an opportunity to join in and to also glorify God for his mercy. So there's an inclusion then into this hope, the hope of Israel because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ as the root of Jesse, he arises not only to become the king of the Jews, but also there at the end of, at the, end of the passage, he arises to rule over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles hope. So we find uh, from Romans chapter 15 that Jesus Christ's very mission was connected to confirming the promises. And we're going to see how that, how that um, comes to be. The next passage we go to is Ephesians chapter 2. And here we find that, you know, in Romans 15, we saw that the Gentiles were able because of the Lord Jesus Christ, to glorify um, God for his mercy and to, um, and to, and to join in uh, with his people. But here um, in Ephesians 2, we're going to take a look and, and think about what is our state if we don't know anything about the promises, if we don't know anything about the hope of Israel. So let's read Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13. And we read there, Wherefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. And when it says at that time, separate from Christ, um, it's talking about before the light of the gospel, before God's ways had been shined into their hearts before they had any idea about God and his ways. And therefore, they just walked in darkness and they did whatever they felt and thought was right, which is kind of descriptive of the times that we live in. But, and at that time, you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and you were strangers to the covenants of promise. And if we're in that state, if we have no idea about the covenants of promise, if we're separate from Christ and therefore excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, look at what Paul says we're looking at. This is our state. We have no hope. We are without God in the world. And that is a bleak, bleak uh, outlook. We want to have hope and we want to be with God. And so we need to be found in Christ. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so because of the Lord Jesus Christ, in him, Gentiles then are brought near to the hope of Israel. 
They can be, we can be included in the commonwealth of Israel and we, we can become not strangers, but co-inheritors or people that look forward to and, and grasp uh, hold to, to welcome uh, those covenants of promise, to look forward to them. So let's take a look then. We have to go all the way back to the beginning and take a look at Abraham because he was the father of the Jewish people. And Abraham began uh, in Ur of the Chaldees. So you'll see there right in the center of Babylonia in Ur of the Chaldees is where Abraham had his beginnings. And, and God goes right to the center of idolatry. That right there was the center of idolatry and false worship. And God goes there and he takes out of there a man. A man from whom he would create a people for his name. Now in the New Testament, um, the Gentiles were being given the gift of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Gentiles were being brought in to the faith. And the Jews were, were, you know, they were struggling with this. How are then, are the Gentiles going to also become, you know, fellow, fellow heirs of the hope of Israel? And the answer was yes. And the reason why was because that they had faith. So we look to Abraham the faithful. And God's um, basis upon who is going to partake of the, of the promises, who are going to partake of his blessings, the basis is always upon faith and so we read in acts 15 verse 14 uh, james actually says they're having this discussion about the gentiles being brought in and he says uh, simeon or simon peter has declared that god at the first did visit the gentiles to take out of them a people for his name now that happened in the in the new testament time but if we look back far enough what we find is that god went directly to the center of false worship. And out of that, he called Abram. He saw Abram, a man who would have faith, and he called him out. And from him, he was going to make a people for his name. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 5, Moses instructs the children of Israel that when they are brought into the promised land and God makes them fruitful, and God blesses them with abundance of harvest. They're supposed to bring the first fruits to God. And when they would bring the first fruits to God, this is what they had to say. Before the Lord, thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father. And so they, they had to make um, an acknowledgement then of their beginnings, that they had humble beginnings. And the only reason why the Jewish people were blessed um, was because of God's um, dealings with them, that he would bless them. And that it, wasn't as, it wasn't that they of themselves um, were anything particularly special, but it was God that was accomplishing this. It was God that was taking out of the Gentiles uh, a people for his name. So Abraham was called out of Ur, and is kind of circled down there in Babylonia, and he made his way up to Haran, and he was in Haran until his father died, and then he continued his trek all the way down into the land that God would show him. And this is what God had to say. So we look to God's promises to Abram, the faithful, faithful Abram. In Genesis 12, we find the beginnings of the promises made to Abram. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house to a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee. Curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We don't have a whole lot of time to spend on the promises to Abraham, but we could spend a lot of time, and I believe that we're going to have addresses further that focus just on the promises to Abraham. But for the for the moment, we're going to pull out a couple things, and that is, firstly, the land that God was going to show to Abram. In Hebrews 11, which recounts the faith of the faithful, Hebrews 11 verse 8, we read that it was by faith 
that Abraham, when he was called to go out, called out of Ur of the Chaldees, to go to a place that he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, not knowing where he was going. And so the question is, would we have the same faith as Abraham? If God came to us and said, just leave everything behind and follow me and just trust me, and I'm going to take you somewhere new, and I'm going to show you a land, and I'm going to give you a land. Would we follow him? And Abraham had the faith to do that. And therefore, God looked upon him, and he accounted, uh, he accounted Abraham righteous because he believed, and he followed him out of the center of idolatry. So, Abram, in obedience to God, he comes into that land, and the Lord God says to Abram, in Genesis 13, um, after his nephew Lot was separated from him, God says to Abram, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art. Now, it just so happens that uh, Abram was in Bethel, which if I was to just go one up and you could see, here we are, just the map of Israel. If you see the Dead Sea right there, if you go just a little bit north of the Dead Sea and almost smack right in the middle of the Promised Land, that's about where Abram was. And from that vantage point, <clears throat> the Lord says to Abram, lift up your eyes, look north, south, east, and west, and all the land that you see, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. The, the main thing that we want to emphasize here is the middle part of the verse, because it says, all the land that you see, to you will I give it and to thy seed forever. Forever. So that land that Abraham saw was promised to him forever. And yet, what we find is that those promises were never kept. God never gave that land to Abraham as, an, as a possession. He did not get uh, to, to have any bit of it. And we find that in, in the New Testament. We read in Hebrews 11, verse 13, speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says that they all died in faith not having received the promises, but they saw them afar off. In Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40, we find that these all, all the faithful of Hebrews 11, they obtained a good report through faith, but they did not receive the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And so, there was no way that Abraham could be given that land uh, forever because the reality was that Abraham wandered in that land as a pilgrim and as a sojourner and Abraham was mortal. Abraham died and Abraham was buried. And so in Acts chapter 7 verses 4 to 5, um, Stephen uh, recounting the, the history says that God had Abraham move to this country, he says, the country in which you are now living, but he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, not even enough ground to set his foot on, which is not much ground. He says, but yet he promised, God promised Abraham that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him. So it was impossible that Abraham could be everlastingly given that land because he was mortal and he died. But what we find in Genesis chapter 22 is the promise of a seed that would be given to Abraham. And this seed would be victorious. This seed would be the seed promise that would bring about victory and salvation to the people. And this seed is pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Genesis 22 is the record of God um, requiring of Abraham, asking Abraham to take now his son, his only son, and, and offer him to God. And Abraham was willing to do that. 
And so in, in the context of Abraham being willing to offer his only son, God says to him, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And, and we know that to possess the gate of one's enemies is to have utter control, to have full victory over the enemy. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was the one that would come and he would be victorious. He would be victorious over every temptation and trial and everything that was in opposition to God. And because of his obedience and in the same pattern as Abraham being, uh, being asked to offer his son, so in the same exact pattern would the seed of Abraham bring this victory and possess the gate of his enemies. The Lord Jesus Christ going together with his father to be a willing sacrifice and overcome. And so that is how then that, you know, we go back to Romans chapter 15. The Lord Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Abraham could in no way inherit that land as an everlasting possession unless the Lord Jesus Christ had come to make the way of salvation possible so that Abraham could live forever to everlastingly inherit that land that was promised to him. And the beauty, the beautiful part and the exciting part for us, friends, is that we also, in Christ, we can share in the same hope, the hope of everlastingly inheriting in the promises and becoming and becoming part of or or holding the hope of Israel as our hope as well. So in Galatians 3, we read that, Therefore, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So if we hold the same faith that Abraham had, and we, and we believe in what God has promised, then we can be accounted uh, as part of Abraham's seed. Because it says in the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed. So in thee shall all nations be blessed Abraham in you in, 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 in the seed that is promised to you. That was the gospel message. That was the good news that was preached before in you Abraham all nations will be blessed. So then it says, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And going to the end of the chapter of Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, we read, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. See, that is the basis upon which, um, that's the basis that God, that God is looking for, by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in Christ, we too can share in the hope of Israel. And it's always upon the basis of Faith, which leads to obedience. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And Abraham had many descendants. And many of Abraham's natural descendants did not have faith. And many of those descendants that were faithless perished in the wilderness. So just because you are a natural descendant of Abraham by no means uh, means that you're going to inherit in those promises. But it is always upon the basis of faith. So... We come then to consider a little bit of, of the history of the descendants of uh, Abraham. And we have this little chart here, which basically just um, charts out the kings of Israel and of Judah. But we know the story, and that was that Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, that he had Isaac, that he had Jacob, that the descendants of Abraham went down into Egypt, 
that they were treated miserably and, and that, they were, that they were enslaved and, and they had to serve and that God brought them out of Egypt with a strong arm and he brought them out through the, through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai and they were constituted a holy nation to God. And they were promised a land and they were given, they were given God's law and God was to be their king. And there was to be a capital. And so an entire kingdom was created in the, in the, in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. So they went and they, and they wandered in the wilderness. God brought them to the, to the promised land. They sent 12 of the of 12 spies in, to spy out the promised land. Ten spies came back with a faithless report. And unfortunately, Israel acted in faithlessness and so because of that for 40 years israel wandered in the wilderness till that generation passed away and then under joshua the the new, the next generation was brought into the promised land and we had the period of the uh, judges until finally the um, the children asked for a king and god gave them a king and their first king was saul who was a miserable miserable choice but God gave them what they wanted and after Saul made a made a terrible um, made a terrible king God says right I will give a king of my choosing and he gave he gave them David who was a man after his own heart and so David then was the king and they had the, they were there they were in the promised land they had God's law they had a king they had a capital which was Jerusalem and they were the kingdom of God upon the earth and so now what we look at is this chart and we see that Solomon's son Rehoboam he makes a mess of things so that the nation is divided so to the north they, there was the ten tribes of Israel and so up to the top we have the kings of Israel and to the bottom there were the two tribes that made up Judah now the none of the kings of Israel were were righteous or faithful at all and so eventually, God sent, upon, God sent the Assyrians and the ten tribes to the north were completely dispersed, um, never to be brought back again to this very day. And yet, uh, to the south, Judah continued on a little bit further, but until uh, it came to the last king of Judah. And his name was Zedekiah. And even Judah had become so faithless. There were a few good kings of Judah mostly were mostly were faithless but zedekiah was it and god had had it and so this is what god said we, we're now going to look at god's promise to restore again the kingdom to israel because when it came to zedekiah god had had enough and this is what we read this is what god's estimation was of the of the, of the prince of israel of zedekiah in ezekiel 21 we read and thou profane, wicked prince of Israel. Not exactly the title that you'd want to be given. Profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is. And I will give it him. And so what we have in Ezekiel 21 is the completion. It's the end of the kingdom of God upon the earth. He says this is it's not going to be the same. It's going to be overturned until he come whose right it is. And that's a key word in the Bible, until. So what we find then in Ezekiel 21, we have to have marked in there, somewhere in the margin, Luke chapter 1. Because then we, we come forward. So then we look, right? And this is the hope of Israel. Who is it? Whose right is it going to be to reign as the king? To bring back the kingdom to Israel? And we find in Luke chapter 1, that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one whose right it is. And when the angel came to Mary and he said, he said to Mary, fear not, you're going to conceive 
and you're going to bear a son, and this is what he says, you're going to call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So this is speaking of an everlasting kingdom, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come as the one whose right it is when the kingdom will be restored again to Israel. So let's take a look then at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, because you know God's promise actually to restore again the kingdom to Israel is confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at this. After the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and he was resurrected, he spent 40 days with his apostles. He, Jesus, in Acts 1, verse 3, he, Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for 40 days. And in those 40 days, Jesus spoke to his apostles the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And the end of the Gospel of Luke says that after he was resurrected, the Lord Jesus Christ opened their understanding to the scriptures so that the apostles' minds, they weren't darkened, they weren't clouded about all those prophecies about a Messiah that would suffer and then reign. They understood that. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks to them about the kingdom of God the apostles' understanding is fully opened about what he means. And this is the question that the apostles have for the Lord Jesus Christ. After 40 days of Jesus preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the apostles, when they came together, they asked of Jesus and they said, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You see, the question was not that Will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's obvious. The Lord Jesus Christ had spent 40 days uh, opening the, the prophets to them and speaking to them about the restoration of the kingdom of God. The only question in the apostles' mind was, well, now you've suffered. We understand that the Messiah had to suffer and to rise again. So is now the time? And they were given to know that wasn't the time. He had to, he had to be... Um, uh, raised to the father's right hand to sit at his father's right hand until the time that the Lord would make Jesus' enemies his footstool. And so the apostles then, they go forward and they preach. And so God's promise to restore again the kingdom to Israel, we find, is preached by the apostles after Jesus ascended to his father. Take a look at the language of Acts chapter 3. Repent ye therefore, they're speaking to the Jews, and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out, they might be found to have been forgiven, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And you remember the angel, when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, the angel said, why are you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that you saw go into heaven, he's going to come in like manner. So, the apostles then are preaching this time. When the Lord Jesus Christ will come, he's going to bring times of refreshing. And when you have language of refreshing, then you're speaking about something that at one time was fresh. And, and he, shall send, he, God, shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive. Here's that word, that little important word. Until the heaven must receive Jesus. Until... The times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And truly, friends, if we go back and we, and we look into the prophets and the prophecies that, um, that God has given us in all parts of our Bible, it all points forward to this time, the times of restitution, a restoration of things. And it has to do with the restoration of the kingdom, that it was cut off because of faithlessness until he comes, whose right it is. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven, there's going to be a great time of refreshing and a great time of restitution. And this is, this is why the Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in various um, 
places, such as Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. He taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. So it is going to be the kingdom of God on earth. In the gospel messages, uh, predominantly in Matthew, it is called the kingdom of heaven. And it truly is the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom in heaven, but it is a heavenly kingdom upon the earth. And so we find that throughout the scriptures, these are three verses that are very clear about God's plan and his purpose with his creation. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Isaiah 11 verse 9 says, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea, and Habakkuk 2.14 combines the two, Numbers 14 and Isaiah 11. And in Habakkuk 2.14, we read, The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And we're going to see that that is actually prophesied again concerning the natural descendants of Abraham. And just another, another uh, uh, note, in Isaiah 45 and in verse 18, God, being spoken of as the creator, says he didn't create the earth in vain. He formed it to be inhabited, but not just inhabited, inhabited by people that know about him and therefore glorify him because they are like him. But let's take a look now, as we, as we said we would at the beginning, what does God think about his people, the natural descendants of Abraham? What are his feelings towards them? And Jeremiah 31, 32, and 33 uh, are full. These three chapters are full of information having to do with God's thoughts towards Israel. So we have time to read just, just a few of them. We read in Jeremiah 31, 27, and 28, God says this, Behold, the days come that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. In other words, there's going to be times when the descendants, there's going to be fruitful abundance of people and of animals, and it's going to be a fantastic time. If you look at this on the second line, it says the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And what's beautiful about that is that is telling us that the ten tribes to the north, the house of Israel, are going to be brought back. They have never been brought back. They went into dispersion under Assyrian uh, captivity, never to be seen or heard from again. But the house of Israel will be brought back with the house of Judah. And those two nations, which were divided because of the foolishness of Rehoboam, are going to be brought back together, the both of them, all 12 tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict because of faithlessness, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. Now, in order for this to happen, there has to be, there has to be a, a conversion, a conversion process um, in the land. But let's take a look again, another, another verse in Jeremiah 31 concerning the, the utter surety of God's plan of, of gathering the children of Israel. God says, Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, in other words, if the sun disappears, and if the sun and the stars go away, if those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. God says, look up. Look up at the sun. Look at the moon. Look at the stars. As sure as those ordinances, those things are in the sky and you see them, I will not make a full end of Israel. So, as we said, there has to be a conversion, uh, a, con a converting process of the, uh, of the natural descendants of Abraham because God is no respecter of persons. And we said from the very beginning that 
God's acceptance of people is upon the basis of faith, just like Abraham had that faith. And so we'll find that Israel will acknowledge Jesus Christ as their true Messiah. We're going to take a look at that very important little, little word until, again, in Luke chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus Christ is just prior to his crucifixion. He's mourning that the Jews would not accept him as the Messiah. But he knew that would be the case. And he says, as he weeps over the city Jerusalem, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, I have had friends that have an understanding. What they, would, they would stop there. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And they would say to me, see, God's done with his people Israel. But you have to continue. You have to continue. He, Jesus Christ says, and truly I say to you, that ye shall not see me until the time come. When ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so there is coming a time, friends, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven, as was promised, that he is going to reveal himself unto the Jewish people, unto his brethren. And take a look at Zechariah 12, verse 10. It talks about this. God says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, this is God talking, and we know that the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 13 is going to come in the name of the Lord. So they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. God's representation, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And it's going to parallel that beautiful revealing of Joseph to his brethren, his brethren that rejected him and sold him into slavery. And he went before to make the way of salvation for them. And when the time came, the, the, um, their savior in their brother, Joseph, he reveals himself to them, the one that they had pierced or that they had um, given up as, as dead. And so Israel will acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as their true Messiah, prophesied by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read of that prophecy in Zechariah um, chapter 12. And so Israel will acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as their true Messiah. And in Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34, a new covenant then is made with the house of Israel. God says, after those days, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And they shall be my people and they shall no more every man. Uh, they, shall, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them, even to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The time will have come when all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. They will all know me and they will have accepted their Messiah. And, and friends, that is when the time the Lord Jesus Christ will reign as the king over the kingdom and the, and the restitution of all things will be brought to pass. Now we end on this slide and this at the heading it says, in thee all nations of the earth will be blessed. And this is where we see that good news, the good news to all people, the Jews and the Gentiles, upon the basis of faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can become inheritors in those great promises made to the fathers, and the hope of Israel can become our hope as well. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and the kingdom is restored to Israel, and the Jewish people are gathered out of all nations of the earth where God has driven them, and they are brought back, there's going to be times of refreshing that will come from the presence of the Lord. And here are some of them. This is our last slide, and we don't have time to look at all these verses, but we're going to leave this slide up so that you can write these verses down or look them up. And, but we've just given a summary. Take a look 
and, 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 and see if this be not the, a fantastic vision of blessing to all peoples. When the kingdom is restored to Israel and the Lord Jesus Christ reigns as the king, not only of the Jews, but we saw that he was also to rule over the Gentiles as well, over the whole earth, the effect will be the abolition of war and the establishment of universal peace. No longer will people be able to even learn about war and how to kill and how to fight. There will be great times of peace. There will be the removal of fear and insecurity from civil life. There will be the overthrow of all tyrants and oppressors. No more corruption. No more people preying on other people and exploiting others. There will be the establishment of a universal empire on the earth. Not one that is ruled in unrighteousness, but one that is ruled justly and fairly and righteously. There will be an equitable distribution of the world's produce. There, the, the prophets talk about times of fruitfulness and of blessing that will come upon the earth. And there will be the manifestation of justice and goodwill among men. There will be the establishment of one universal religion in all the earth. Not every man doing that which is right in his own eyes or whatever he feels is right. But there will be one way and God's way will be kept and it will bring about peace. There will be a new educational system based upon divine principles. There will be the uplifting of humanity mentally, morally, and socially. There will be truly the restraining of sin when people are not allowed to just do whatever it is that they feel to do that hurts other people. And there will be the elevation of God's way as supreme. Now, you, you look around and you consider the world today and all the ills and the woes and the, and the disgusting things that are going on and you compare what we see around us in the world with what is prophesied to come. And what a refreshing vision that is. Truly, this will be times of refreshing that will come from the presence of the Lord. And we end on this note, Isaiah 32, verse 17, that when he comes back, he will reign in righteousness. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness shall be quietness and assurance forever. So may it be, friends, that we, like Abraham, have faith and we embrace those promises that God has made and that we long for the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return as that promised seed, the time when we too might be given immortality so that we might be able to inherit in those promises everlastingly with all the faithful. Thank you.